Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Jacobson, and I'm a product manager on the Android developer team, specifically focused on the developer experiences for large screens and foldables. I'm Kara Vallari, engineering manager. I run most of the UI teams. Um, before we get into this talk today, first, why don't we take a look at why you should care about large screens? Um, right now, there are more than a quarter billion active, devices, uh, active large screen devices running Android, meaning there's hundreds of millions of reasons for you to improve your application experiences to delight your users. And when we talk about large screens, we're specifically referring to tablets, desktop class devices like Chromebooks, and large foldable devices. And one of the things that I'm really excited about in this talk especially is that many of the tips and tricks that we're going to share that you should be able to use today are actually learnings from when we did the work ourselves in many of our first party applications. We've made a lot of mistakes along the way, we've learned from them, we've updated our guidance, and we want to share that with you so that you can kind of jump ahead and accelerate your development and not make the same mistakes. Um, additionally, if you're looking for inspiration within your own applications, try out your favorite Google app, see some of the things that we have done to improve our experiences on these devices, and you can kind of learn from that and take that into your own application. But before we go into some practical do's and don'ts, we thought we'd talk about design and quality so that we set the stage for what we're trying to achieve when we say we should support large screens. When an app does nothing to support large screen devices, it may end up looking something like this. And it basically means this UI has done no effort to, for example, think of layout. Um, we see a lot of the large screen support. There's many aspects to it, but a huge part of it comes down to UI and layout and how your app looks on a larger screen. For that, um, we heard loud and clear from both developers and designers of you needed more guidance, right? Like there's a lot more real estate to fill, for example, when your app is running on a tablet or a desktop device. So how do you fill that space it is a hard question. And so we've been working really hard on giving you a lot of guidance. And so the Material Design website has a bunch of new information around adaptive design and what are the different things that you can think about to really not just blow up your app, but use that space smartly. One of the areas I really want to point out, because it's going to be really important, is canonical layouts. And we call canonical layouts an exercise that we did of looking at apps that support large screen in the wild and look at, our, could we distill it into typical app structures that we could then recommend back, right? So what are the typical structures that apps are actually using that really work and help you place the information into the screen in a way that makes sense? For example, if you have your content in more of a parent-child sort of relationship, so say you have a list of emails and then an open email, that kind of relationship is very well described by what we call a list detail layout, where you place, when there's enough space, you could place these side by side and you convey the hierarchy of your information. Um, but also it allows us to say, well, when there's less space, we probably only show the detail, right? So this is one structure to think about and think of that kind of hierarchical relationship between your content. If instead your content has more of kind of a main content and supporting content sort of relationship, then you can use a supporting panel. And think, for example, YouTube does this, like you have the main player, and that's a really important piece. But maybe you have playlists and other things, and these are supporting content that when the space gets more reduced, you may want to deprioritize, or either hide or move somewhere else. And then supporting panel helps you think of that, like how do we keep space for a main content, but still have supporting content that exists. And finally, the third layout that we really came to was feed. And it, this comes out when you have different items in your content, but they're all kind of siblings. They're all similar things. Sure, one may be something you want to represent a bit bigger than the other, but they're siblings. They're all part of the same information hierarchy. In that case, you end up with a feed and think of like news app, right? Like you have different articles and you want to show them all on the screen. And so you would end up using these kind of grid layouts that really allow you to say, well, Little space, I'm going to do one column, but if there's more space, we can show them side by side and use kind of more smart use of space. Because we know there's a lot of developers in the room, uh, we're going to say we did um, just announce a new guide on developer.android.com that goes into the three layouts I just mentioned and then how to implement them, both in views and compose. So hopefully, we're giving you a lot of pointers of if this makes sense and if this inspires you on how to fill in the screen, well, here's how you action on that and how you actually implement it. OK, so I talked a lot about design, but then I said I would talk about quality, right? And how does this relate to quality? Well, we've published what we call the Large Screen App Quality Guidelines. And these are a set of tiers that we define that helps us reason how does an app support large screen? What is their support? 
And what are the next steps to better support large screens? So we defined three tiers, which you can find in the page, uh, which really help us talk about like basic, better, and best is the nicknames we've given them, of the, the different levels of support. And I'll go quickly into these. But before we get to those three tiers, there's kind of a sad place that goes before them, which is large screen restricted. And uh, when an app does no kind of support at all, we end up in this place where, as a system, we don't know what to do with the app. We're not sure we can stretch you to fill in the entire screen, because we're not sure you're going to actually be able to behave correctly. And so we have to put a lot of apps into this compatibility mode that we call restricted. And this is a really, really sad place. Like, It's not a great user experience. It's not a great experience for you as a developer to know that your users are using this. Placer will warn users um, when installing an app on a larger screen that this will happen. And so hopefully no one in the room has an app that will actually fall into this category. Um, but let me go through common things that would put you into this category so that you're aware. The very first one is if you're declaring your app as non-resizable, by definition, we can't resize you. Right? And so that's a clear signal to us of, well, we know you're not going to support this, so you have to go into compatibility mode. Please don't do that. Another super common one is restricting the screen orientation. Apps that say they are portrait, well, it turns out most tablets out there are used in landscape. And so if you say that, surprise, we have to put you in compatibility mode. And then min and max aspect ratios. Think as well, we're talking about desktops, Chromebooks, uh, the era of free form windows. We want to be able to do all of that resizing. If we can't be sure we can do that, we'll end up in this state as well. Those are the three more kind of layout-related ones, but there's a couple more. Um, you want to think of app continuity and how you store state. For people who haven't seen a foldable device before, it's very common to kind of start using on the outside screen with a folded state. Say you start filling in a form, and halfway through you open your device to finish. If the app loses all that state, that's a horrible user experience. And so we want to really make sure you're avoiding that, and you should be able to persist state across changes in screen size. And finally, we see quite a lot of camera compatibility issues, and we'll go into those a bit later. All of those things would put an app into large screen restricted, and we really, really want to avoid being in this place. Hopefully, that doesn't happen to any of you, and so we can move on to the real three tiers. And so as I said before, we nicknamed them basic, better, and best. Let me go quickly through them. In basic, the main idea is your app does run on a large screen. You do fill up all the screen space that you're given, but it doesn't look nice. Right? Like it's usually we find a lot of blown up experiences, and so we really want to avoid being in the state. Um, use all of the guidance I mentioned earlier. We have a bunch of layout guidance. Think about the design so that you can get into the happier place, which is tier two. Tier two is what we consider apps that are really thinking about large screen and are making a good use of that space. Maybe it's multi-panel layouts. Maybe it's one of the canonical layouts I mentioned earlier. And also, you're starting to show some support for, say, input devices. Hopefully, this is the happy place. This is where we would love to see all apps reach, because okay? this is a good experience for the user. It's not a huge amount of work. And it gets us into that place where you really feel like you're using the space smartly. We do have a tier one, which is then the, the differentiated tier, right? Like hero experiences, if you go above and beyond and say you support stylus, you support um, folding devices, can have postures, maybe you do something special for that, keyboard shortcuts, drag and drop, all of these things where an app shows that it goes above and beyond to support large screen, well, that would put you into tier one, and that is really kind of high level hero experiences, which means we will also be probably encouraged to feature those on the Play Store. They will have higher rankings because users are more interested in using these apps. We do have a dedicated talk that goes much deeper in the tiers, because I've just kind of glanced through it. Um, so please check out the specific talk on that if you want to know, uh, or check back the developer.android.com page I mentioned earlier that has all of the detail. Cool. With that, let's get into the practical tips that hopefully you can take away and start applying to your applications right away. Starting with reachability. As Clara mentioned, uh, most tablets or larger screen devices are often used in landscape. And so the way a user holds the device, interacts with the device, interacts with the UI of your application is going to be different than on a typical phone device. And that means some of the common placements of UI elements may be more difficult to reach, causing them to have to adjust their grip, take their hand off, 
just have less comfort using the experience generally. One example of this, and, and why we often show like the nav rail versus bottom nav bar example, is thinking about the navigation of your application. If we overlay the reachability chart, you can see some of the more center-focused navigational elements are pretty hard to reach, meaning that the user is probably going to need to take their hand off or adjust the way they're holding the device to actually reach those elements. And these are very commonly used things, like users are going to navigate around their app. It's going to be something they're going to do frequently. So when we recommend the nav rail, we're doing so because, hey, generally, these are much more reachable. If I do need to adjust my grip to reach the higher to reach ones, I maybe need to move my hand slightly up rather than completely taking it off of the tablet to actually touch those navigational buttons. And this provides generally a better experience. While navigation is one example, you should think about the most used UI elements in your application and place them in the easy to reach areas. Um, Take a look at the next talk for more information about just general large screen design principles and philosophy so that you can build a great and uh, you can design and build a great UI experience for all devices and displays. Um, just to summarize, don't make UI elements really difficult to reach on these devices and do intentionally think about the design and placement of most accessed UI elements. The next issue that we've seen a lot with applications is exclusive hardware uh, access. Uh, beginning in Android 12L and above, all applications will run in multi-window mode. And a lot of applications uh, assume, hey, if I'm portrait only, if I'm unresizable, I'm going to be the only application on, on the display at any given time, meaning I don't have to worry about this. That's no longer true. And so this is an example of applications handling it OK. You have two different camera applications. When you tap on one, it uh, requests access to the camera. It actually uses it and the other one gracefully loses access to the camera without crashing. Many of the issues we saw were application crashes, so definitely make sure that you're handling exclusive hardware resources uh, gracefully. Um, the, the do here is check for access before actually using it. Fail gracefully if you do randomly lose access to it. Use Jetpack libraries if you can, because we will obfuscate much of this from you. So we will do the work so you don't have to. We know that doesn't solve all use cases, but if you can, we recommend Jetpack. And then last but not least, actually test this. Um, it can be so easily diagnosed using the, the resizable emulator or the desktop emulators. Place two applications side by side that are requesting access to the same exclusive hardware resource and see what happens when yours loses access, as an example. Uh, Related to that, but a little bit different, is thinking about activity lifecycle events and how you handle them. Uh, again, this is about thoughtfulness and intentionality. Uh, a lot of what we saw, like here's the example. I am watching a video app, and I want to take notes on the video. And maybe the video app on pause pauses all running content. So every time I try to take a note, the video that I was trying to watch to take notes on now pauses. That's a very frustrating and annoying user experience. In this example, we have the Photos app, which actually intentionally chose to pause because they assume, hey, I'm, I'm watching my own photos. It would be weird to pause my photo with, when using another app. Um, but when I browse through Chrome, it pauses the video. Just think about these things. Think about how you want your application experience to behave when it's not the only application on the display. Um, instead, what you should be doing is removing uh, any, uh, uh, freeing up any appropriate resources in on stop, and just thinking about the end-to-end -end experience you want to provide when having multiple things on the display. The next one is probably the one I experience most commonly and the one I'm most passionate about, and I was already having a conversation with somebody here about this. Is tablet Boolean logic based off of arbitrarily identified display metrics? So what we're looking at here is a smallest width uh, qualified uh, resource file where you have an is tablet boolean when the smallest dimension is 720 density independent pixels. I've seen everything from 600 to 720 to 800 to 840. Like people just pick arbitrary values. If you research this on Stack Overflow, there's some answer from 10 years ago with 800 upvotes. Um, it's not a great way to figure out how to adapt your uh, application experiences. And I actually have a story from one of our first party apps. We had this logic in one of our apps that basically gated access to an experience within an application to only phone devices. And so on a foldable device, you could enter into this application experience on the outer display. You could unfold the device, and that new display registered as a tablet. You could still use the experience because you were already navigated to it. But as soon as you left it, you couldn't get back to it. So you had to refold the device to get back into that experience if you wanted to use it again. It's just a terrible user experience. It's because of this type of logic. So please, please, please avoid arbitrary is device type logic. And I'll teach you on what to do instead. So if you're thinking about UI and layout related adaptivity, um, use window size classes. So 
These are our recommended breakpoints. They represent typical device usage patterns, but they are device agnostic. So if you're running in multi-window mode, if you're running in a freeform window, your UI and layouts will still adapt appropriately without having to think too much about this. If it's not a UI or, oh, sorry, before I jump into that, um, as previously mentioned as well, we now have a utility library called the Windows Size Class Library, uh, produced with com uh, the Compose Material 3 stable release that makes it super easy to use this in Compose. It's a single function call, you get observable layout breakpoint states, and you can adapt your layout as simple as that. It's one of my favorite new libraries. And if you're not thinking about UI and layout, and you're instead thinking about other things, we've seen people use is tablet logic to gate things related to telephony. And it's like, hey, like a tablet could actually support those scenarios, so why not? So, so actually look for what does my application experience depend on in the device? If that requirement or dependency is satisfied, enable it. Don't restrict it for, for no reason. Um, the next one is camera preview. Claire mentioned on this briefly. I'm actually not going to go into the solution for this, because we do have a dedicated talk. I'm just going to describe a little bit more about some of the problems that you may experience with camera applications. Again, related to every application now runs in multi-window mode, and you can have very different kind of requirements or experiences as a result. And that comes down to alignment of different types of orientation. So every device has a natural orientation. Most phones, it's portrait. Most desktops, it's landscape. Some tablets, it can vary. But you have to align the display orientation with the natural orientation of the device with the sensor orientation. And these things can get out of alignment depending on the device your application is running on. You'll learn a lot more about how to solve that in the, the related talk. But one easy tip, use Camera X. Like I mentioned, if, we're, if you're using Jetpack libraries, we will do a lot of this for you. If you have requirements beyond what is supported in Camera X, you'll learn a lot more on how to fix these in the subsequent talk. Another common problem we see is related to insets, and we call insets the relationship between an edge-to-edge -edge app and the system UI. Think things like the notch, uh, gesture nav, or the new taskbar that was introduced in 12L. All of these things cause insets to change within your app, and you want to be able to handle those gracefully. When you don't handle these, uh, especially if you don't handle them dynamically, you can find that things like the new taskbar from 12L that comes from the bottom may include very important parts of your app. For example, if you're using bottom navigation and suddenly the taskbar comes up and you're not reacting to those insets, you're losing a huge part of functionality of your app. So you want to make sure that you are handling insets dynamically so that you can react and resize. To do that, we have the Window Insets Listener APIs. These provide you callbacks every time the insets change. So make sure you are using those instead of just assuming that the first value you get is what you'll get the entire runtime of the app. And make sure you're then updating. Say you're updating your margins to move content appropriately and fixing those. The next one we see a lot is apps that are clearly not tested on large screens. Um, for example, blown up layouts. Um, or we see a lot of broken behavior in multi-window. And all of these can be easily solved by using a bunch of the tools that we mentioned in the tools talk. Um, so I highly recommend, if you haven't seen that, you go back to the tools talk. As a quick tip, definitely use Resizable Emulator, because it allows you to test your app in different screen sizes really quickly. It allows you to test multi-window as well, like you can launch into multi-window and make sure that your app is behaving correctly. And use reference devices while you're developing, because it allows you really quickly to see how your app looks on different reference devices, which cover most of the ecosystem. Um, so highly recommend that. Otherwise, go look for the talk for more. And finally, to leave you with a good one, how many times have you assumed that all of your users are using touch? Well, that's not necessarily true. We have a huge fleet of Chromebook devices that can run your app. There will be a lot of users using keyboard or mouse or trackpad to interact with your app. Also, accessibility users may be interacting with your app with different accessibility devices. And so it's really important to make sure that you are supporting all of these inputs, not just assuming that people are going to touch your screen. For that, we have a dedicated talk that goes extremely in-depth on this, uh, the key to keyboard and mouse support across tablets and Chrome OS. Highly recommend if your app has any of these issues, you look into all of that detail. Um, but obviously, the, the do and don't is don't assume there's only touch input and support keyboard, mouse, and trackpad. OK, that was a lot of tips and information in 20 minutes. Um, I hope some of it sunk in. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>